Hi folks, I'm June with the first episode of Nibbles and Mouse Bites. This is an additional series on programming retro computers where I hope to get more focused, but will also be slightly rougher in the presentation. This first episode will focus on the basics of assembly language programming. I had a few requests by some of the viewers and my patrons to give a kind of assembler primer since lots of folks would like to follow along and better understand. Hopefully, this series will work as a supplement to help folks keep up with the main channel. Okay, so let's dive in. The first thing to know is that assembly is just a language that converts to numbers. There are no data types, no looping constructs, and it flows from top to bottom in general. Assembly is as bare metal as you can get since you're dealing with raw memory. So what is assembly, really? It's just a simple human-readable language that produces machine-readable code. In other words, it gives us, the programmers, something more readable than just raw numbers. And what features does it provide? Nothing save for speed. Everything you might want in a programming language has to be constructed by building them up from individual instructions. So what's an instruction? Every instruction is composed of a mnemonic and optionally two operands. A mnemonic is a three-letter moniker that refers to a grouping of opcodes. An operand can be a number, a register, an address, or nothing at all since they can sometimes be optional. Think of instructions as English-like statements we make to the computer. Opcodes are numbers treated like verbs, such as paint house. Operands are the adjectives, such as red, in paint house red. You could also argue that operands are the subject in the sentence, or what to operate on. Opcodes are chosen from a mnemonic grouping based upon how the operands are written. How operands are written is called an addressing mode. So what do I mean when I say mnemonic grouping? Mnemonic grouping is just a fancy way of saying every mnemonic refers to a whole set of opcodes. For example, the LDA or load A mnemonic means we want to read a value from RAM into A. But the computer has eight different opcodes to load A, so how do we choose which opcode we want to use? Well, this is where the addressing modes come into play. Each addressing mode tells us, the programmers, what data to operate on, and the assembler which opcode to use. There are 10 addressing modes available, and each has a different representation in assembler. Implied accumulator means that the data to operate on is either implied by the opcode or the results are stored or manipulated in the accumulator. Immediate simply means to operate on the operand directly rather than treating it like a memory location. Absolute means to use the operand as an absolute memory address and operate on the data at that address. Zero page, like absolute, is a memory address, but implies that the first byte of the memory address is zero. Indirect absolute means read the address stored at this absolute address and then operate on data at that location. Absolute and zero page indexed are effectively the same as zero page and absolute, but with either the values of x or y added to the address before the operation occurs. The next two modes, indexed indirect and indirect indexed, we'll get into in another video because their semantics are a bit convoluted and hard to understand in an overview. For now, just know that they exist. The last mode, relative, is unique to the branching instructions and means jump execution to the location relative to the location of this instruction based upon the number given. Don't worry if you're having trouble following all of these modes. We'll be diving into each in more detail in this series. For now, just be aware that the specific opcode that the assembler chooses depends on how we write our operands, as you can see in these examples. So what is a register, anyway? A register is an 8-bit temporary memory for working with data. The 8502 has six of these that we can see as programmers. The first three are A, also known as the accumulator, X, and Y, also known as the index registers. 
The next three are the status register, which tells us the state and the modes of the 8502, the stack pointer, which tells us where the top of the stack is currently in memory, and finally, the program counter, which tells the CPU where to read the next instruction from. The program counter is unique since it's actually a 16-bit register in two halves. Okay, so I've used this accumulator term a few times. What is it exactly? Well, it's a slightly confusing term with an old meaning. Basically, it's just a synonym for the A register. Whenever an opcode has a result from an operation, such as addition, it has to store the result somewhere. So what we mean is that the A register accumulates the results from instruction execution. Okay, so what's an index register? Like the accumulator, this is a slightly confusing term with a really old meaning. An index is just a counter used for walking through memory, kind of like how you would use your index finger to page through a book. Since they're still registers, they can still kind of be used like the accumulator to hold temporary values. Take this zero-page indexed LDA instruction, for example. This means add the value in X to the address zero before loading data from RAM into A. Basically, just think of X being added to the address in the instruction. Okay, so now that we have all that terminology in our heads, how exactly does the CPU make use of it? How do CPUs work? Well, the short answer is that they work in cycles. One cycle in the 8502 is typically the following steps. Fetch and execute the next opcode or operand, increment the program counter, and repeat. The thing to remember is that the CPU never stops. It's always running, even when it seems like it's stopped. There's much more to a cycle than this simplified explanation, but for beginners, this should be enough to get started. Okay, so let's see this in action using an animation. In this setup, we'll see what happens when the first two instructions are executed. We have a simple program loaded at address 1300, which is the next address to execute as indicated by the program counter here. During the first cycle, the LDA immediate instruction is loaded into an internal instruction buffer, and the program counter is incremented by one byte so that the operand can then be loaded in the next cycle. In the second cycle, the CPU fetches the operand and then executes the op code by loading it into the A register. Again, the program counter is incremented by one byte so that the following op code can then be loaded in the next cycle. The third and fourth cycles work exactly the same way as the first and the second. Fetch, increment, execute, and increment until the second instruction is complete. So what is this status register I mentioned earlier? It's a special register where each individual bit represents the results of an operation or the mode the CPU is in. Each of these bits has a meaning except for the sixth bit, which isn't usable by us programmers. Going from most significant to least significant, we have the negative bit, which is set if the accumulator has a negative number stored, the overflow bit, which is set if the last arithmetic operation produced a number bigger than 8 bits. The break bit, which is set if the CPU encountered a BRK instruction and is currently running the break handler for it. The decimal bit, which is set if we want to do binary coded decimal math, which is a fancy way of saying doing base 10 arithmetic rather than base 2. The interrupt bit, which is set if interrupts are disabled. The zero bit, which is set if the last operation was zero or a comparison was equal. And finally, the carry bit, which is used for borrowing during arithmetic or during a logical bit shift. Now that we've covered all the registers, what's this zero page all about? To the 8502, memory is organized in pages of 256 bytes each. The zero page is just the first page in memory that starts at address zero. The 8502 has an addressing mode specifically to make accessing this memory fast. Instead of using two bytes to refer to the absolute address, we instead use a single byte, and the leading zeros are inferred, which saves an additional CPU cycle. Unfortunately, because it's so fast to access, this page is also the most used by code in ROM, and using it for our own programs is tricky. The last major thing we need to cover is the stack. What exactly is the stack? Well, when we talk about it, think of a stack of plates. 
As we push things onto the stack, it grows, and we keep track of the top through the stack pointer register. The key to remember is that each time we push or pull, we are moving the stack pointer up and down. Only during pushes do we write to memory. The stack is a temporary place to store 256 bytes of data. Like Zero Page, it's hardwired to location 100 and can only be moved through external hardware like an MMU. Internally to the CPU, it's used by the JSR and RTS instructions to save and restore the program counter address just before a subroutine was invoked. The CPU designers also gave us the push and pull instructions to push and pull data to the stack at will. This is typically used to save the value in a register temporarily for later use. What is a little counterintuitive is that the stack grows from highest address to the lowest address in the stack page, so it's common to see a high number in the stack pointer register. So now that we know what the stack is, let's see how it's actually used. In this animation, our stack is on the right, and the first four bytes of the stack page are shown here. Like before, we have a simple program loaded at 1300 hex on the left. We'll use this to demonstrate the stack. During the first execution step, the LDA instruction will load the immediate value AD into the A register. Next, the jump to subroutine instruction, or JSR, will save the program counter to the stack and cause the CPU to jump to the address in the operand, or 1400 hex. Once we're inside the subroutine, we execute the push A instruction, or PHA, to push the A register onto the stack. This has the effect of saving the value in A temporarily when we change it in the next instruction. Now we can safely change the value in A with an additional LDA instruction without worrying about losing the value altogether. In a real program, we'd be safe to do some actual work, but this will do for now. Once we're done working, we'll use the pull A instruction, or PLA, to pull the topmost value off the stack and store it back in A. Lastly, we use the return from subroutine instruction, or RTS, to jump back to where we came from. This has the effect of pulling the address from the stack and storing it back in the program counter. Note that it's only one off from the next opcode. This is because the CPU is hardwired to increment the program counter after an execution. Well, there you have it. A brief introduction to assembly language programming on the 8502. I realize it was a huge amount of information in only about 10 minutes, but try not to overthink it too much. The rest of this series will be deep diving into the instruction set that we have available to us in the 8502, so a great deal of this will likely crystallize as we go through them. Be patient and persistent, and do try to use the other online resources such as Visual 6502, Assembly in One Step, sp Step by RTK, and above all, a good emulator with a machine like the 128 that has a machine language monitor. The more you play with it, the better you'll get at it. Before I go, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons. Dan Sanderson, Karsten Lervud, Ernesto Perez, Peter Simonson, Joe Sorensen, Drew Nab, D Ninja, Richard Comish, you guys are all amazing. You keep me inspired and engaged, and I hope this series is up to your expectations. Thank you so much! If you'd like to participate and be a patron, you can follow the Patreon link down below in the description. And aside from that, see you in the next episode!